Okay, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Chris Scott. I work for Outdoor Recreation Northern Ireland and we deliver the Secretariat services for the Outdoor Recreation uh, Network. Um, so you're very welcome today to this, the, the fourth webinar in our, in our series uh, since, since May. And we're delighted to have uh, 146 people registered uh, for this webinar. And I can see you're all uh, slowly getting yourself uh, on, online as, as we speak. Um, so great to see delegates from across the UK and Ireland uh, signing up and, and supporting the webinar today, which is all about maximising outdoor learning opportunities. Uh, my role, uh, we've quite a lot, as you can see from the running order on the on the screen, we've, we've quite a lot to get through in a short space of time. So, so my role as MC is just to keep things moving and very much a, a less is more role from me today. Um, just to say that this webinar is being uh, is being recorded. Um, so uh, and the slides will be also be, be shared. So the video from the webinar and the slides will be shared via easing to all those who, who signed up to, to the webinar. That will be shared tomorrow. So so you can sit back and relax and, and, and listen and, and, and take things in without having to worry about furiously taking taking notes all the way through. Um, so I'll, uh, you can see from the the running order on your on your screen there, we have we have quite a lot to get through. Um, great breadth of speakers, great breadth of expertise um, from from across the sector. So we we we'll look forward to to hearing all hearing from them in a moment. I'm not going to go through them all in, in, in detail and I will do that as we come as we come to to each one. If you just move on to my next slide there, Alan, please. So I would encourage you as we go through the webinar is to make sure that you ask questions as, as we go through. So we have a number of the speakers online today who are going to be giving live presentations and a number who are also have given pre-record. But so the, the, those who are online will be able to answer the questions directly back to you in, in the question panel. Um, and but also it's really useful for the members breakout session um, at the end. Uh, if we have a track record of the questions coming through, that will really help shape the conversation in the members breakout room. So please do engage with us as, as we go through, uh, ask questions. If you just move on to the next slide there, Alan, please. Uh, try to uh, aim your question towards somebody. So, for example, if it's uh, a question for Anne Hunt, um, you might want to just you know start your question with with Anne and then ask your question. Just so we're clear who it's for, who you would like a response from. If it's from the whole panel, just say panel, um, and we, we go from there. Um, so, and again, there, we appreciate there's expertise amongst the delegates as well, not not just those who are presenting to us today. So, if you feel you've done something in that area or would like to help answer the question, please do. So let's let's get some conversation going in the in the Q&A panel as we go through. Just the next slide there, Alan, please. So just to remind members then that after this uh, this uh, broadcast, then there will be a, a, a members meeting afterwards, um, which will allow us to uh, discuss with those who have presented and discuss amongst ourselves uh, the, the topic uh, today. So again, that that's just for, for members uh, as an additional benefit to members. And you will have received a separate link to that. So you'll exit this live event and then enter what is a standard uh, typical Teams meeting then. So you'd have received a link for that in your in your easing. Um, if you haven't, um, please email Elizabeth. You'll see the email address on the screen. Please uh, email Elizabeth over the course of the webinar and she'll ping that uh, link through to you. Uh, and then you, we'll give you a few moments at the end of this to, to move across to the to the live event. OK, well, listen, that's that's everything from from me now. Uh, the, my first duty is to, is to pass over to um, Fiona Groves, uh, who, who has done a pre-record for us. So Fiona is the is the chair of, of, of ORN and has done a, a pre-record uh, session to, to set the scene for today's webinar. So I'm going to pass over to Fiona. Thank you. And hello everyone. I'm Fiona Graves, the Chair of the Outdoor Record. Recreation Network. And here today to set the scene for this webinar. I'm going to do that by looking back. It seems like a totally different world now. Back in March, we were at our conference in Edinburgh, looking at this same topic, sharing experiences, writing the world, thinking about how we engage children and young people in the outdoors. We spent time looking at how to increase participation, the importance of well-crafted activities and well-designed spaces and places, understanding more about inclusive access and the barriers and challenges that we face. And then came the world, world crisis and the revelations from the coronavirus lockdown, every moment outside feeling more precious to us all, a 
A strange world where children and young people are away from education and outdoor activity settings. Parents and carers making the most of their allotted time. Their one exercise session a day. Taking walks with their children to parks and spaces maybe that they've never visited before. And with indoor venues off limits, many young people taking it to parks and socialising outdoors some noticing the outdoors for the very first time. Of course, it's not been the picture for all. Gaping inequalities did become clear, depending on whether you had access to local green space or a garden, live in an urban or rural area, whether you had a flat or a house, whether you were able to socialise with extended family and friends, and, and as it transpires now, what parts of the UK you live in. And in our workplaces, they, they were severely affected and it became apparent that although we're all in the same storm, we're not all in the same boat. Some of us will sail through this pandemic and our health and jobs intact, yet others will lose one or both or potentially more. <clears throat> and frustration at work, as those on furlough feel guilty and constrained that they can't help, while others at work are missing their colleagues to help with all the intense miti mitigation planning that's had to go on. Longer working hours in some instances and a very reactive environment as things changed every day. Sites and centres and businesses not able to run and activities stopping. And we do now understand more. It's brought into sharp focus this world of ours, this outdoor world and how we must think about nurturing our world for the future. And it's largely dependent on making real life connections with our world and opportunities to learn more about it. And we now understand that a thriving green, blue, wildlife rich environment does actually uh, benefit our physical and mental health. Those with access to nature and green spaces, leading more active lives, having greater mental resilience and able to take better and informed risks about being outside, altogether being more rounded. And it's never been so important uh, for us to facilitate those connections with our outdoor and natural world and try and get those who are in power to help us make change, changes for the better and for the future. And our, uh, our roles become really frantic as jobs are set to be lost in our heritage establishments, like the National Trust. And we try and get others to listen in the hope that we continue to help create a platform for curious, passionate and critically thinking minds who want to be in, enjoy and look after our outdoor settings and our natural world and then sustain it for the future, giving all the benefits that it provides. And here at ORN, we've discovered we can get more done by working with others and finding innovative ways to improve what we do. And so I'm really pleased to welcome today our contributors, all of whom have been doing pivotal work during restrictions and at very difficult times. And they give us a powerful reminder about why this is also important and how it might be able to approach, how we might be able to approach the uncertain but hopefully brighter future. Thank you all and I look forward to seeing some of you later in discussion rooms. Great Fiona, uh, thank you very much. Um, so sat in the scene perfectly there. It's also, you probably realised from the, the logo on, on Fiona's uniform there that she's taken up a new role as, as education, learning and, and policy manager with the, the Wildlife Trust as well. So we'll obviously wish Fiona all the best in, in, in that new role. And uh, unfortunately, as it has been communicated to the members due to Fiona's commitment, understandable commitment to that to that role, she's, she's stepping down uh, after a year as, as ORN chair. Um, and it's fair to say that Fiona has done a huge amount of work to help reinvigorate the network over, over the last year, um, hugely dedicated to driven to driving the vision of the network forward. Uh, we as a Secretariat Director of Recreation in Northern Ireland will, will miss her dearly um, for her guidance and her energy and her, and her good humour uh, across the last year as well. So, and I'm sure Fiona's going to be joining us with at the members meeting later, so it'll be a good opportunity for, for, for members to have a chat with her at, at, at that stage as well. So, so I just wanted to take 
take the opportunity at this stage at Fiona's last official uh, webinar, although I'm sure she'll not be a stranger, but her last official webinar to, to say thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Um, so now we're going to pass on. We're delighted to have Anne Hunt, um, who is the Chief Executive from the Council for Learning Outside the, the Classroom. Um, so Anne's going to talk to us today. Can you hear me OK, Anne, first of all? I, I can, Chris. Thank okay. you. Can you hear me? <laughs> and even better, I can hear you. This is great. There's so many moving parts in these in these webinars, so it's great to hear you. So Alan has your first slide up there. Uh, you're live on the screen, um, so I'm going to pass over to you and, and, and let you begin. And thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Alan, can I have the next slide, please? Lovely, because actually I'm here um, as relatively new Chief Executive of the Council for Learning Outside the Classroom. What a year to take on a new role. Um, to represent the consortium, so the Turning Learning Inside Out Consortium. So in April, um, myself and the Outdoor Education Advisors Panel and Institute of Outdoor Learning drew together a consortium to try and um, corral um, and mobilise a strategic response to the COVID crisis. Um, so this is the current list of the, it's the networking organisations really, so it's all the leads for the CLOTC sector partnerships and other associated networks that have come on board as well. Um, so there'll be lot, some of each one of those uh, logos represents hundreds of organisations in many cases. So it's a really powerful organisation um, or consortium. Um, the one proviso, of course, is our, you know, we're small NGOs, so that the capacity to, to move that forward is always, uh, is, is not as much as we would like. So we rely on the good support of these organisations to help us do it. Uh, next slide, please, Alan. So just a little bit of context just to follow up. These slides are really text heavy, but they've got all the links in so you don't have to do scribbling afterwards. So I apologise for the text heaviness, but it's it's the strategic stuff that's just all there in writing. Uh, so the context was widening inequalities among children and young people. Uh, I think some of the recent reports reflect that we've got both the chronic and acute issues here. So the chronic stuff um, reflected by that UNICEF report showing, you know, low levels of um, well-being and happiness in the UK compared to other countries. Um, there's a really nice uh, quote from EEF recently out of their school planning guide that just reflects that common misconception that somehow those that wide diversity of outcomes that learning outside the classroom delivers for children and young people is somehow different to their academic achievement and attainment, but it isn't. They're, they're all part of the same thing, part of the same logic model. Um, and then some of those acute ones uh, reflecting the, the the widening of um, the problems now, the, the deepening of the problems. So that, uh, that widening of the gap between um, different communities being exacerbated by COVID and then Natural England constantly uh, producing, uh, they produced a new one this morning actually with a nice infographic about how children's relationship with nature is, is every month since over the last few months. So that's worth, worth looking out for as well. Um, so all this points to that urgent need and opportunity to act now because we know the evidence is really strong that learning outside the classroom can deliver outcomes for pupils right now, especially health and wellbeing. Next slide please Alan. Um, so what we've got is a unique opportunity and a unique willingness to work in new ways. I've, you know, I've worked in this sector for a long, long time, never seen it. So we've got demand from schools because they're, they need to take their learning safely and effectively outside the classroom, both for uh, infection control, but also as an effective way of delivering their curriculum. And we've got supply from providers. We've got that expertise out there in all those learning outside the classroom sectors, including the outdoor learning sector. So what we want to do is match that supply and demand and scale up the coordination of, of putting those two things together. And what we want to try and do is not only deliver outcomes now through delivering at really high quality activities, but also by adopting a progressive embedded learning outside the classroom approach will change the system for the better as well. So if we get it right now, we'll deliver outcomes now and going forward. And that's what we're that's what we're trying to do. Um, next slide. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so we um, came, up, we came up with a consortium statement, a joint statement together, submitted that to government in May and subsequently, along with a, a proposal, a cost of proposal. Our proposal is to target the schools in most in need um, and the activity would be designed to respond to the, what we know about the barriers for schools. So increasing conference confidence, increasing signposting to high quality services, really simple. Um, but that needs investment. We, we can all do it at a certain rate, but we need investment to scale that up and to speed it up. So that's our ask. Uh, meanwhile, while we push um, and try and get support, um, we're developing free tools to, to act locally, so to make it easier for schools and providers to understand 
how to get around the issues and, and, and the current restrictions and work in new ways. So on our website, again, the links there, you've got case studies to show where um, providers from different sectors, including outdoor learning, are working with schools to make that work. Webinars again, so there's the past webinars you can view and new ones that you can join on to. And also there's a, a free guide and some tools for schools developed by OEA and CLOTC, um, which is um, do, do use them. You know, they're there, they're the sort of standard um, handy hints what you what you need to think about before you go outside including links to national guidance which is just the most incredible resource um, and then tools for schools to be able to audit their activity too and and plan what they're going to do going forward embedding that approach um, we were certainly involved in sort of weekly conversations with dfe so hopefully we've influenced that recommendation in the guidance to for schools to consider taking their curriculum outdoors um, or albeit within guidelines. Likewise, that day visits to indoor and outdoor venues for educational purposes are allowed, uh, albeit residential visitors are not allowed yet for domestic and abroad. Um, and again, use that get, get outside link uh, guide because it has those links that will allow you to sort of keep tabs on how that, how that national guidance is being interpreted into national guidance by the Outdoor Education Advisors Panel. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then as well as the consortium dealing with that sort of the big, our big aim, main aim is about delivering outcomes for young people through schools, so through supporting schools to get their curriculum outside. Uh, we're also working on specific issues that, and the activity tends to have been led by different members of the consortium. So it was a big campaign led by um, UK Outdoors with the support of PGL to try and reverse the um, uh, embargo on overnight trips and try and allow that decision to be made locally in local context between schools and providers um, and that got that commitment to a formal review in November so that will be reviewed but obviously we continue to to to, to push for that uh, as part of that there's a new policy and procedures document for residential centres so again that's available that's been sent to all home nations um, IOL led a really useful survey to allow us to articulate the scale and scope of the challenge and then school travel forum is really um, an expert in all the issues to do with insurance and uh, things like that. And they have some very specific asks that the consortium are also supporting to make it easier for schools and the residential sector to recover, to, to manage through the crisis and to recover. Um, and I suppose the one of the key things is we have this commitment from DfE now to have a working group to look at all these issues. So how do we scale up and coordinate that activity and support for schools? Uh, next slide, please, Alan. And then there's other related activity that's complementary, um, being um, led by individual consortium members. So you'll hear about the um, petition for Nature Premium from uh, for later. Uh, Field, um, Wildlife Trust have issued um, a call for an education select committee to gather more evidence from the Our Bright Future partners. And there's lots and lots of um, new recovery related delivery projects ongoing as well. So it's a really active area. And of course, that's just within outdoor learning. So, and there's all the other stuff going on in all the other learning outside the cl um, classroom sectors too. Uh, next slide, please. So these are our asks, really. We're here to help you. If you know about any significant comms or lob lobbying campaigning, let us know and we will do our best to join the dots and augment that messaging. Send us your case studies so we can showcase where providers and uh, schools are working together and give other use those to give other people confidence that they can do it too. Uh, let your networks know that the consortium exists and what we're trying to do on your behalf. Uh, and do think about using those free guides and tools that help schools embed that as a process because that will help in the short term and the long term to both schools and providers. Um, there's my contact detail. Please do send me any questions. And I think the last slide, Alan, is just again, just those the consulting partners, just to say, you know, please join us. Contact me if you want to come on board. We'd, we'd be delighted to welcome more members. And that's it. Thank you. Great, Anne. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, great, great presentation and, you know, great to see that combination of strategic approach and how things have changed for us and how strategy potentially needs to change with with practical day to day measures as well for how we can deal with the here and now and really showing there that that that's the last slide really showing that the benefit of your consortium approach and your your joint up working and you know we obviously experience that ourselves within within the outdoor recreation network as well so and i'm sure um members will be keen to avail of those uh, those shared resources um 
and also come back to you with some uh, examples of case studies to support support your various campaigns and initiatives. So, yep. Yeah, so we'll, we'll share that information, um, as I say, in, in the follow up in the follow up easing. So thanks. Thanks very much again, Anne. And say take take an opportunity, folks, to, to ask Anne any questions, of course, in, in, in the question panel. And Anne will be joining us for the breakout room uh, later on as well. OK, so for the, the next one, we're going to go to, to, to Wales, um, uh, a little country, but but lots going on um, is, is the name of the presentation. It's from from Karen Clark, who's the children education and lifelong uh, uh, learning, who works in children education, lifelong learning and skills. Goodness, that must be some size of business card, Karen, um, uh, within Natural Resource Wales. So Karen has done a pre-record and I think her presentation is ready to go. So I'm going to pass over to, to the presentation. Hmm. Hello, uh, I'm Karen Clark and I am an advisor for Natural Resources Wales. Uh, apologies for having to pre-record this due to technical issues, but I am on the meeting, um, so hopefully might be able to answer some questions later. Um, so despite being on lockdown in Cardiff, um, I'm going to attempt to give you a very quick tour of Wales um, in relation, obviously, to what's happening in uh, outdoor learning and in Natural Resources Wales works. So um, some basic facts about Wales. Uh, we are a very small but diverse country of roughly 20,800 square kilometres. We have approximately 3.1 million people, which is 4.8 of the UK population. We have award winning coastlines, national parks, 15% woodland cover, mountains, bogs, nature reserves, etc. So many different lovely natural environments for our learners to engage with and lots of excellent outdoor learning providers to support that. To set the scene, Natural Resources Wales is a principal advisor to Welsh Government on the natural environment. My team cover our health and learning work area and these functions go hand in glove um, as all of our learning work encourages physical and mental health improvements such as increased physical activity and enhancing well-being. Probably exactly like all of you, COVID has made us all reconsider a lot of our ways of working, living and learning. With lockdown, we've had to cancel many of our planned projects, programmes and campaigns. For my team in NRW, that actually freed us up to examine where we were best placed to support all ages with enjoying the multiple benefits to health and learning through connecting with that natural environment. So rather than concentrating on what we couldn't do, we focused on trying to look at the bigger picture, identify gaps and making those connections. One of the gaps we identified was that learning in, about and for the natural environment was completely absent from the new draft curriculum for Wales, which is set to be in place by 2022. We were able to give robust advice to our partners and Welsh Government on this, and we're delighted that it's now given equal precedence to indoor learning. We supported Welsh Government further by providing content for taking learning outside for keeping school safe guidance on schools return following lockdown. The outdoors is obviously being uh, advocated for as a safe learning space for schools to teach in and many schools in Wales are outside for about 50% of the school day, but that is absolutely not across the board, so there's plenty of work still to be done. Um, children's well-being is obviously a main consideration uh, at the moment and we all know how the natural environment can contribute to that. We worked in partnership with the Wales Council for Outdoor Learning to publish the High Quality Outdoor Learning in Wales document, the usefulness of which has been referenced by Welsh Government in relation to both the curriculum for Wales and the Keeping School Safe guidance to support learning outside of the classroom. And a copy of this document has been sent to every school in Wales. We also continue to signpost educators and families to our learning resources to facilitate blended learning so that at home, at school, during lockdown, local lockdowns, and return to school. In 2019, Wales declared a climate and then a nature emergency. This became central to our health and learning work and we encourage our partners and customers to think about not just what nature can do for them, but that old adage of what they can do to support nature. Um, for example, we now deliver school grounds development teacher training in a slightly different way, encouraging collaboration between teachers, learners, and nature through a process of survey, plan, improve, deliver and maintain to improve the school landscape to promote sustainability and biodiversity, which will then in turn provide wider learning and health benefits. Children, as we know, have huge concerns about the impact we're having on nature and we felt that our work needed to do more to include their voice. 
So we work with the Children's Commissioner uh, Office in Wales um, and children and young people from across Wales to develop a children's rights based approach within Natural Resources Wales. We're now starting to embed this into our policies and processes, um, although uh, the launch of our children's rights charter was delayed um, due to COVID-19. Outdoor learning is obviously an umbrella term and in Wales that covers everything from learning in school grounds to single day trips to residential adventure or field studies learning. Obviously right now there is very grave concern about the future viability of many of our outdoor learning providers and residential centres. To try to support a bit, Natural Resources Wales facilitates three outdoor learning networks which work at different levels to um, deliver, enable and influence outdoor learning in Wales. Outdoor Learning Wales Network uses local level network groups to deliver outdoor learning to all ages um, that meets a local need. It's very inclusive and anyone can be a member of a local network group. Wales Council for Outdoor Learning acts as a voice for the sector and brings together organisations that support and deliver high quality teaching and learning in the outdoor environment. Membership encompasses organisations such as the John Muir Trust, RSPB, Welsh Wildlife Trust, National Museums, etc. And at mid-level, we have the Outdoor Learning Training Network Wales, which ensures quality standards in developing and delivering accredited outdoor learning qualifications. Membership is for providers delivering across Wales. So back to filling in those gaps and making those connections, we worked with Outdoor Learning Training Network Wales to develop a suite of learning in the outdoors qualifications that fit the Welsh context from level one to level four. We found that the Welsh audience was looking for increased flexibility and accessibility. So there is now a very broad qualification pathway um, for outdoor learning accredited learners. We still embrace forest school and coastal school, which are distinct pedagogies. We now have a diverse range of topics, though, from playwork outside to outdoor curriculum coordinator to well-being in nature with much more to come. In March 2014, we delivered a conference posing the question, where do we want outdoor learning to be in five years time? Well, it's quite fair to say we didn't expect to be here. Many items on the wish list from that conference, such as embedding learning outside the classroom into the new curriculum have come to pass, but we never envisaged a future that looked like this. My colleague Sue Williams and myself came up to Edinburgh last March to attend the Orn Conference in the Botanic Gardens. We came away enthused and energised and almost as soon as we returned to Wales, we were back in lockdown and working from home. Many of our partners and outdoor learning providers were on furlough or on stop. Many of us have had to dig deep and rethink our offer. And while it's really easy to dwell on what we can't do now, there have been some major benefits for our work. By moving online um, to online training and meetings, we have saved time, money and become more sustainable and much more accessible to our customers spread across Wales. Yes, Outdoor Learning Week Wales uh, became Stay at Home Week instead, but we embraced social media. We got our film clips and learning resources out there for educators and families trying to learn at home. And we saw a huge upswing in participation, which still continues. We had to cancel our Acorn Antics campaign, which supports seed collection for our planting programme in Wales. Um, and this year it looks like a really great crop, which is very frustrating. But to mitigate this, we are now delivering webinars, which will hopefully engage more schools for next year's campaign and help it run more smoothly. Um, we've also worked on a wide range of new learning resources that are waiting in the wings to go online. There's definitely a heightened awareness of the benefits of taking learning outside for Wales for both educators and the learners, which Welsh Government wants to see continue as the curriculum for Wales beds in. Education, as we know, never stands still. So we will continue to look for opportunities to support the sector to get all ages learning in, about and for the natural environment. Due to the COVID-19 situation, there's now a lot of talk and movement around a green recovery agenda, including a possible green nature service. There are big statements on providing large scale placement opportunities as part of the Kickstart programme to support future employment. 
Right now, it's all talk, but these could turn into real opportunities. And it would be a really interesting time to consider rerunning our Where Do We Want Job Learning to Be in Five Years Time conference. So watch this space. Um, if you'd like to find out any more, uh, our contacts are on the slide there for you. Um, and as I said, despite having to pre-record, I am on the meeting, so can hopefully unmute if there are any questions. But uh, thank you for listening. Great, Karen. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I can see plenty of questions coming in on the panel there. Uh, Anne Hunt has certainly been worked worked hard by the by the delegates. So thank, thanks very much for all those questions. I'm sure more will come in for, for Karen following that. I, I remember your and, and Sue's presentation at the ORN conference back in Edinburgh in March. Um, only a number of months ago, but really does seem like a lifetime ago at, at, at this stage. So I think we all returned from that conference very, very enthused. But as, as you correctly said at the end, it is it is time to, to take stock now and think what is next? What does this new environment uh, pr pr present to us? And as you correctly said, whilst there's been many challenges and events cancelled and initiatives cancelled, it was great to see uh, Natural Resource Wales and, and Karen's positive attitude there to, to making the most of the situation and considering how we can we can change things in, in, in the future. Um, really pleasing to see a, you know, a impact you've had on the national curriculum, for example, there. That's fantastic work. And perhaps as Secretariat, we, we, we'll chase up on that high quality outdoor or learning for Wales, a publication you, you mentioned there, and hopefully get that distributed to, to members as well. I'm sure that'll be a valuable, a valuable piece for us to look at. So thank you, Karen. Thank you, Natural Resource Wales. And again, they'll be joining us for the for the breakout room later. And please do ask any questions in the in the in the question panel. Um, I'm going to pass on now to uh, Sarah Collins uh, with the National uh, Nature Premium Campaign. Can you hear me OK, Sarah? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Well, we can hear you loud and clear as well. So I think Alan's going to get your 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 slides up on the screen there and we'll pass over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sarah Collins. I'm the national coordinator of the Nature Premium Campaign and the deputy chair of the Forest School Association. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, we are calling for a nature premium to fund regular nature experiences for every child and we're not talking just about England, we want to include every child in the UK. The idea came out of an FS meet, FSA meeting when we were talking about the impact that lockdown would have on children that we work with. And we're not representing the FSA or any organisation, but we are using our connection with the Forest School Association to demonstrate that as directors of a national charity, we have some credibility. Um, when we say nature, we mean any form that a school can make work for their children, from visiting city farms, to walking in woods, to rewilding school grounds, to forest school, conservation, gardening, the list goes on. Uh, next slide, please. The campa campaign focus is about getting children regularly into nature. This is a little girl, um, she had to self-isolate with her family because of her own vulnerability and her family's underlying vulnerability during lockdown. And this was the first time she'd left her house. She took herself off on her own and was worrying about her mum and family getting ill and germs. She was trying to process her own fears. Many of us have stories like this and we've been concerned about the mental and physical health of children and young people during lockdown. We know that the evidence for the benefit of time spent in nature is well documented. We want politicians to make a political decision to invest in the nature premium to fund regular nature experiences for children to help them recover from lockdown and set them up to learn. Could I have the next slide, please? Could you play the film, please? While in lockdown, we've had over 100 days of limited access to family, friends and the natural world. We have a plan to reconnect children and nature. The Nature Premium campaign is asking the government to help schools get children outdoors and we need your support to do it. Scientific research shows that when children spend regular amounts of time in nature, this has a positive impact on their mental health, their physical health and their long term success. In 2012, the government recognised that children's physical health is important and a sports premium for schools helps get children more active. 
We want a nature premium for all children. To help us achieve this, we need you to sign the petition, to share the message through social media and get your local MP on board. If the nature premium campaign is successful, our children will have the best chance of getting out and really flourishing. To find out more about the science behind the nature premium and how you can get involved, visit www.naturepremium.org. You will all know that when you've seen the positive impact that time spent in nature has on children, you can speak from the heart. And this is a powerful message and is supported by well-documented evidence. So we're not trying to prove anything. We are asking for a political decision to invest in a nature premium because it has the potential to both transform children's lives and to lay the foundation for a society that will care for our environment in the future. We have used a two pronged attack, raising awareness via social media and a petition, and we've been speaking directly to politicians and members of the House of Lords. And we're pleased to announce that on the 7th of October, Vicky Ford MP, Parliamentary Under Secretary uh, for the Department of Education, responded to three written questions concerning the Nature Premium submitted by Stephen Morgan MP. At the end of her response, she stated that I have asked departmental officials to meet with representatives of the Nature Premium campaign to discuss the potential merits further. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I'd like to go through why we think we've made good progress. Um, I'd also like to say that um, we made decisions and taken action beca because we saw an unsatisfied need in education. It's not a criticism of anyone else. We've never run a campaign before, so maybe we're not going to go about it using conventional approach, basically because we don't know what the conventional approach is. We have approached organisations asking them to support us, but viewing it from their point of view, uh, we have no track record and we could be seen as a reputational risk or, res or a re resource drain. And I would like to clarify at the moment um, that um, to date, uh, we haven't been included in the Council for Learning Outside the Classroom Consortium, but we are always open to talk with uh, other organisations. I think we've made progress because we have a simple idea. It's about getting children regularly into nature. It should be of interest to anyone who has a child and anyone who was a child. Children need to spend time in nature for their own well-being. We should show us that more time spent in nature, the more pro-environment we become. And as a society, we need individuals who understand nature and our place in nature so we have the skills to address climate change and the new green industries. So the time is right. Lockdown demonstrated the inequity of access to nature and reminded the public of its value. High profile reports, including the Living Planet Report 2020 on biodiversity loss, the World Economic Forum Evolving Risks Report that for the first time showed top five risks to world economy in 2020 were all environment related. The United uh, Nations Decade of Ecological Restoration, the UK's presidency of both the G7 and COP26 next year mean that the message why nature is important is being discussed widely. The need is urgent for the benefit of children, the need is urgent for our natural world and the need is urgent for the benefit to the UK economy. Our strength is that as volunteers, we haven't had to worry about the implications that a political campaign might have on our jobs, our funding or those who work for us. We haven't had to worry about funding streams being turned off because we haven't got any funds. Uh, so far, we've invested a huge amount of time and effort and less than £100 on the campaign. We also recognise that many organisations have been severely limited in any action they could take because furloughed staff couldn't work and those remaining were massively overburdened and some organisations cannot act politically. We recognise this. We're a handful of volunteers and we work nimbly. We have a range of expertise that we can draw on. As a campaign coordinator, I've been able to ask for comments on research, for blog articles to be written, for web design and animated films to be made. And we've kept the campaign focused. Politicians need to make evidence informed decisions. The evidence is well documented and we need a political decision. At the beginning of lockdown, the government policy concerning rough sleepers was changed over 48 hours to provide a bed for anyone who needed one. Politics can change their minds. The nature premium would cost less than 1% of the Department for Education budget. It would be the similar to the cost of Eat Out to Help Out, but would have an impact on all children and the associated school and outdoor education sector. 
Um, we've asked the FSA members to speak to their MPs. This is a picture here of uh, one of our supporters who wrote to her MP about the campaign. One FSA member spoke to George Eustace and got his commitment to speak to Gavin Williamson and find out why there's a disconnect between def DEFRA policy to connect children to nature and the Department for Education lack of engagement with the issue. You can see the benefit with engaging with MPs as Stephen Morgan's question has resulted in an opportunity to discuss the campaign with department officials. We've built a network of supporters who don't normally speak to each other, but they all have the same interest in getting children into nature. So we have economists, we have uh, the Bishop of Durham, we have uh, research scientists who all have the interest of getting children into nature in mind. And we've spoken to those outside our usual so social circles. For example, a Conservative Environment Network. We focus on telling politicians and interesting parties about the nature premium. And we view our activity as a growing mycelium that is interconnecting to make a complex network of hyphae occasionally produced in fruiting bodies. Next slide, please. We want to make the most of this opportunity and we want to talk to organisations. Um, we want to represent getting children into nature and the impact that would have on the outdoor education sector. But we see this as a concept we should take to the United Nations as part of the rights of the child. We re we aim to reinforce the point that this is a growing global need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, great to see such a, a driven a grassroots ca ca campaign a, mo moving forward there. And I'm sure there's there's many people on the on the on the call and on the, on the meeting today that will look look to how or consider how they can engage with you both on a personal and indeed obviously a, a professional uh, basis as well um i don't think there's any need for apology about unconventional approaches in this in this current climate in fact it's quite it's quite refreshing um to hear sometimes we can all be a bit curtailed by by our environment so so great to see some direct action uh, be, be being taken and we wish you all the best with your with your further campaigning and so on so thank thank you very much uh, sarah um, so Sarah was joining us today in her capacity, obviously, with the Nature Premium campaign. Um, Sarah is also deputy chair of the Forest School Association. Um, and we're going to pass over now to, again, a pre-recorded video from, from Matt Harder, who's also a director with the Forest School uh, Association. Uh, Matt uh, is doing a pre-record uh, because he's doing his day job today, which is a primary school teacher. Um, so he's otherwise occupied. So, um, but we're going to cue his video now. He's going to talk about developing uh, the assessment of outdoors. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm really sorry. I can't be with you, but I'll be working. Uh, it has given me the chance to be at home and record it next to my father, though, so that's all good. I'm a primary school teacher. I have been for 12 years in the same school, but I'm also a freelance forest school leader in various schools, and I'm one of the directors of the Forest School Association. I set up my business uh, Bluebell Bushcraft about five years ago now um, and I do various ranges of outdoor learning from bushcraft for a school and curriculum based learning and inset training for that in different schools. Key things that I've found at the moment from Covid is that there seems to be this much more receptive atmosphere towards outdoor learning. Uh, personally I'm busy five days, six days, seven days of the week um, I've just finished a 17 day stint of doing various bits and pieces of outdoor learning in different guises. Um, so there is an appetite for it at the moment. And I know one of the questions was how are we going to maintain that later on? I really think it all comes down to advocacy. Uh, yes, we want it at the moment because of transmission rates being less outside. Um, but how do we maintain our uh, key understanding of, of why it is so important in schools uh, or outside of schools as well for outdoor learning of all types. So I've sort of broadened it out by thinking about purpose um, and also process. One of the key things that I think schools are very concerned about at the moment is the idea of children being quite a long way behind where they should be academically and there can be that re reticence to use more outdoor learning because they're worried well they're not at the desks and they're not able to write as well 
Um, personally, I was working with a key worker group in lockdown, and uh, I had a very, very uh, difficult child uh, who didn't write at all. He was a year five student, uh, all manner of learning difficulties, but he was working as a year five student with year twos, year ones, even some reception children. Uh, and we did a lot of time out in the forest school area just as part of their well-being and part of their trying to get them connected to a bit of nature. Um, and in these sessions, I found that he was orchestrating a whole narrative of role play uh, with evil wizards and the, the word vanquish came up. Now, this is from a child that can barely spell anything. And for him to use that type of vocabulary was a real benefit. Uh, to our school's marking and, and assessment for, for that particular child. So I think the opportunities are there. It's just a question of uh, how we market uh, the benefits of the outdoor learning to hit those uh, um, ideas of is it going to be worth it? So the purpose there is that whole objective meeting uh, tick list. But the process also we're coming out of the time when children have had very little time to be with peers and, and friends due to being stuck at home and only just now they're thrown back into school it's starting to progress but all of that learning of teamwork and collaboration has has taken as much of a hit as, as maybe the academic uh, criteria that they, they've missed out on so i think process is just as important if not more so than the purpose of, of outdoor learning. So uh, as one of my roles, I do inset training uh, in schools. And one of the, the key barriers that we find is, is that idea of uh, meeting academic assessment opportunities. Um, I recently did an inset training with a staff in Crawley uh, for about 65 teachers and they were very much on board with taking the children outside because a lot of the children don't have gardens and it's uh, very much a, an impoverished area um, but they were just going to let them play outside which I completely get the benefit of but then they were worried about it being an afternoon of their, their school time that the children were missing out on learning and I was explaining actually it doesn't have to be that way because as long as you're aware of the curriculum you can then notice what is coming out in those outdoor sessions uh, as much as if you were planning it yourself because they will do the teamwork they will do the speaking and listening uh, there may be elements of den building or science that you can notice without actually having to plan them in as as uh, activities that said if you plan them really well then you get even more benefit in terms of assessment opportunities and i think maintaining that and through this sort of test finger in the water type job that we've, we've got at the moment with schools wanting to be outside more. I think that might be the, the catalyst that helps uh, schools realise how important this might be going on in, into the future. So in terms of the process, obviously I mentioned collaboration and, and the whole teamwork element, um, but also we know about the well-being of children and how being in nature can benefit their, their mental and their spiritual and their holistic self. Um, so I think that's that's really key. And I think teachers are becoming slightly more aware about it as well. There's a lot of programs, things like Headspace meditation uh, that a lot of more schools are doing. And there's no reason why they can't do those outside on a, a pre-recorded on an iPad or something like that. Um, one of the things that my head teacher from two years ago asked me to work on, so pre-COVID, uh, was a way of tracking how children developed in terms of their well-being and in terms of their resilience, their independence, things like that. And uh, I came up with this sort of progression. It's a 10 stage progression that goes all the way from early years, in fact, pre-early years, all the way up to adulthood. Uh, so the, the stages are fairly broad and the objectives are taken from things like the Lurven scale. They're taken from well-being surveys. They're taken from 
national curriculum objectives, SMSC correct, uh, objectives, lots of different things that I've sort of pulled together to put into these sort of uh, 10 stages. And that's something that we've used in, in my school as a way of tracking how a child progresses uh, over the course of months, if not years. So the learning scale, I don't know if any of you know about it, is a very much a snapshot, as most well-being things are, because how can you track progression in well-being? Well, well-being is, is the end product, really, and we're talking about how they develop the skills to make sure that they are um, developing in their emotional awareness so that they can uh, communicate the, the different levels of their well-being. So it's uh, freely downloadable and I'll put the link, the links in there at the bottom of the page uh, for anyone to go and, and download if you want to use them. I think this is one of the, the, the main takeaways of uh, what we're doing in our school in the way that we're trying to show that we are respecting as much of the non-academic growth of the children and the, the way that we're dealing with the traumas that they've uh, obviously experienced, whether that's actual bereavement or the just the trauma of, of being removed from friends and family. So I, I hope that's going to be helpful for some people. Um, please feel free to contact me uh, via my, my Twitter or my Facebook if you have any questions. Um, and uh, I really hope I can uh, catch up on this webinar at some point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, we'll be sure to pass on our, our, our thanks to, to Matt. Um, really interesting to I mean to see uh, somebody really at the the hard face of it all and, and dealing with children day in day out about you know the impact outdoor learning can can have in, in, in that environment. So really useful to see some practical examples for someone who's 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 deeply thought and and, and prepared uh, his proposals with it within schools. So so re really good to see that and hopefully that's something we're able to investigate a little bit further in the future. And again, we'll be sharing those those links to the various pieces that uh, Matt talked about there, and you can you can follow him on his various social media platforms to and further insights as well. So, so we'll, we'll pass on our thanks to Matt. Um, coming up to our to our last presentation now, we're doing okay for time. We're just a, a few minutes few minutes behind, but that's that's not too bad given given how these things can go. Um, so we're going to be joined by again on a, on a pre-record um, by Natalie White, who's principal teacher and development officer um, for outdoor learning learning outdoor support team or, or, or lost. Um, and uh, Natalie joins us from the East Ayrshire Council in, in, in Scotland. So Natalie's presentation is, is queued up there, I think. Yeah, so we're ready to go. Uh, I'll pass over to that and I'll, I'll come back in at the end. Just, yeah, just for why I'm a principal teacher and development officer for outdoor learning in the Learning Outdoors Support Team in East Ayrshire Council, which is in the west coast of Scotland. And the service is an authority run provision which provides support to all of the educational establishments, three to 18, so that's early, primary, secondary, ASN. Um, as part of Curriculum for Excellence, there's an expectation that the learner journey should have outdoor learning experiences across a diverse range of experiences and settings and contexts. So within the LOST team, we have teachers, education officers, award officers and instructors. When lockdown began at the end of March, um, our service embraced the challenge to continue to support learning in the outdoors and this strange new world. And the good weather certainly helped. We found that many of the families um, with the schools had started to engage in local spaces, parks, pathland, paths, um, woodlands, community gardens. Um, and the teachers were really, really keen to utilise that, that new experiences that children and families were having, um, but weren't quite sure of the, of the support that they could offer because the usual frameworks we have where there's textbooks, resources, teacher-led support um, wasn't there. So we capitalised on that um, learning environment and we started to rewrite some of our lesson plans so that they were accessible to everybody. Um, so the main kind of thing that we did was um, set up our Learning Outdoor Support Team website and on that we had a whole section for learning at home. So the family friendly format of the lesson plans um, were accessible for parents, but also for teachers, grannies, anybody that wants to access them. Uh, and we also then found that if we did it with a two minute clip, two minute video, that that sort of grabbed their attention, got, w w was something that was quite easily accessible. 
there. So we did things like maths trails, identified local history trails that they could do, um, created other lessons that were very much supporting the parents to do to lead the teaching and engage the children in things that were quite exciting and different. Um, and the, 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 they then needed that just that wee bit extra support on what was the learning expected out of this. So we also linked to things like Parent Zone and Education Scotland's um, support systems that they had in place for teaching parents how to teach uh, certain things like concepts of maths and, and, and literacy, etc. And um, we tried really, really hard to make sure that all of the lessons that we put out there and all the two minute videos needed very little equipment and also that we hadn't excluded people that maybe didn't have gardens. So some of the things we used green spaces that we accessed green spaces, so big parks we would suggest things like that um, and other ones where it was a very urban based stuff so that you were using buildings uh, we tried to you know have a variety of different contexts of learning spaces as well uh, one of our biggest successes was probably the lockdown lodge you can see in these two photos um, on the, the left and the right there we, we did a challenge where we had seven uh, ten half day activities and um, for p7s that would have been going on a residential um, experience and the teachers in the schools just basically um, issued the two challenges a day um, and, and it all sort of culminate, culminated with a, a shelter build and the challenge to sleep outside um, and to date that resource has been accessed over a thousand times so uh, it was a really huge success that one um, as schools have returned, there was new barriers to overcome and recognising the benefits of teaching outdoors, the lower transmission rates, better health, mental health outcomes and um, more physical activity, connections to nature, more space. Schools very quickly got in touch with us to find some solutions. So increasing the capacity of the school estates was the first hurdle and we went out and did audits of school grounds, identified in spaces both within and out with the school grounds. Uh, this needed us to do some risk assessments. Um, and they needed to create it in, in um, collaboration with the schools uh, to allow them to be able to access local green spaces, maybe adjacent playing fields or woodlands that were close to the school that they could use as part of routine and expected school settings. Um, and teachers are now accessing those spaces as well as the additional um, for, for, for learning, but also as well as the um, additional playtime bubble space that we've, we've, we've now created for them. They, they have actually got extra space. Um, some schools were um, just concrete playgrounds and so we've, we've done some things on line markings um, and used uh, paint to decorate them and make them a wee bit more engaging. Uh, and we've also had a number of schools involved in a biodiversity increasing uh, activity which has been really lovely. So we worked in partnership with the outdoor services team and looked at the frequency of grass cutting and tried to reduce this and we've reduced it to once a year and the once a year the, the, the maze is getting cut out. So the children are designing something um, so that it can be cut into the space. And this was a really lovely, um, we, we went out and we measured out and, and, and did it with our pilot school. And that space is now used much more frequently by the children in new and creative, imaginative ways. Um, th things that they wouldn't have, have been doing otherwise because it was just a football pitch. And that was the purpose of the, of, the, of the green space. It was just as a football pitch. And now what we're finding is they can use it for learning and um, finding out about biodiversity, about bug hunts, about the bug hotels, all these kind of lovely things, as well as um, using it in you know, very creative and imaginative ways, playing, running around in it and um, hiding in spaces and, and, and using it as a maze. As education returned, we recognised that teacher training was going to be a key feature um, of needing support. So we developed a few simple posters. This is Mrs. Nar, a nice acronym to remember the reasons for going outside, why we need to learn outdoors. And we also created one called Small Steps and um, that showed teachers and exemplified to them just simple things they could do. It didn't need to be a big hour long lesson with lots of resource planning and, and lots of resources in order for it to be good quality. Sometimes just the small snappy things um, like 15 minutes outside as a starter for a topic can be a really engaging way of, in, uh, of use, using outdoor learning. We also helped uh, develop a online resource for teachers uh, through SAPO, which is the Scottish Advisory Panel for Outdoor Learning, uh, sorry, Outdoor Education, and that teaching resource is now online and accessible across the whole country. We've also been delivering webinars and presentations um, for a number of organisations, but also within our local authorities and to our schools. But probably the most significant piece of work was teaching the classes um, with their teachers in their own playgrounds. So we've been doing teen teaching since the, since the return in August. 
where we actually take a, a class outside for 45 minutes to an hour and show the teacher a number of different things that they can be doing. So in some of the slides next, I'll be showing you some of the things that we've been doing with those teachers when we talk about taking them outside. So recognising that teachers needed support, we were keen to show them that it's the curriculum outdoors that they can do, that the outdoor environment should be viewed as another classroom, so to speak, context. So if they were going to teach ICT, they would go to the computer lab and um, they would go you know, to the gym hall and they could also go to the outdoor space. So for learning, it can take place anywhere. And so once we had kind of overcome that barrier of it needed to be you know, a sat down thing, it was about showing them where the learning is in the, in the real world. So some really nice ones that were, were easy to exemplify within maths and numeracy, for example, is angles. So we know that there are angles, that there's, there's right angles, for example, on all the windows and all the doors, and this symmetry, um, both naturally and created, so that the two lads here say on the crate, um, actually underneath the crate, you can see there's a, a log, and they were trying to show us um, re reflective symmetry either side of the, the log. And, um, you know, we did den, we do den, den building uh, on, on some of our estate, school estates are very close to green space and we use that green space. You can do fractions, you can do time and um, you can do timetables as I already mentioned. It's all there already in the environment. So it's about showing the teachers where that is. So we found showing teachers um, how they could engage in literacy learning um, outside was, was one of the really big benefits. Just for example, some sharing stories, listening to um, to set texts, that character, describing them and creating them, and um, retelling journeys. Um, so taking the children out all on the same journey, then gave them a shared experience and we could then rewrite that as a story or we could use it as diary entry, creating things and making things and using it as instructional writing, um, functional writing, describing events, going to a place, reading a text in context. So a really lovely one that we've, we've, we've done a couple of times now is the Harry Potter. And we take Harry Potter um, story, we read it in the woods, and we then go and get them to go and find their own wand. Because as you know, the wands were all made from, from tree branches. So they find a branch and then they start to create their own um, wand. That, that shared experience can be really, really um, engaging for the young people. And we're finding that their, their creative writing as a result of that um, is, is far greater quality and um, doing things like word walls, um, using fact sheets, identifying trees, using keys. Uh, there's so much literacy that can be done in context and in a meaningful way that that seems to be really, really working for the young people. And finally, uh, we looked at resourcing schools. So some of our schools didn't have sheltered spacing, so we gave them um, these dining shelters. So a, a number of schools have got those now. Uh, we also did literacy boxes, ASN boxes and heritage boxes, where it was an ideal topic that could be used at early level, first level or second level uh, within, a, within a classroom. Uh, additional to that, we've also done lesson plans, but we've done them on themes. So we have uh, each theme has four lessons, one that can be delivered inside the classroom, outside the classroom, in the home setting and outside the home setting. So a set of four, this particular one's on water, there are others on, on reflections or sim, um, reflections or shadows, uh, the weather, water systems, things like that. Uh, and we also gave practical uh, resources to some of our schools as well. So things like protractors, trundle wheels, compasses and the lesson plans to go along with that to, to support and, and, and aid the teachers. So I hope you found that useful um, and if you'd like to make contact, I'm more than happy to uh, have you email me. It's natalie.white at eastairshire.org.uk um, and also on Twitter uh, as Nancy White or at EAC Lost. Thank you very much. My my goodness, um, uh, Natalie and her team have certainly been incredibly busy over over the lockdown period. I mean, the the pupils, the teachers, the parents within East Ayrshire are are so fortunate to have that level of support and and, and thought and, and connection with the outdoors. I mean, the practical examples there are are simply in, in, in incredible. Um, so we'll definitely be be looking at, at, at 
at looking at those resources and, and activities that, that have gone on. I mean, uh, yeah, quite quite overwhelming the amount of work that has went on during the, the COVID period there. But we all know that's built on a really solid base of, of, of work and approach to outdoor learning in, in Scotland over the, over the last number of years. So, so yeah, so no, a fantastic presentation by, by Natalie there and, and thank you very, very much for that. Um, so yeah, so that, that brings us to a close for, for this session in, in, in this format. Um, it just leaves me to, to thank all the presenters um, for their for their hard work in uh, preparing their presentations and then delivering their presentations either live or, or in pre-record. Um, again, we're, we're indebted to their to their expertise and, and, and time to pull a lot together. So uh, thank thank you very much for that. Thank you to all of you for, for, for joining us. It's been great to see a really strong engagement rate throughout throughout this throughout this webinar. So thank you very much for that. As I said, we'll, we'll be following up with further information um, tomorrow. Um, I, there's information on the screen there for folk about how they can join the VIP breakout room. We're going to be moving over there now, just in a, in a, in a few in a few minutes. So I'll give you a second just to exit this webinar and then uh, join up to to the members meeting. Uh, also, from my perspective, thanks to my colleagues Elizabeth and Jane for pulling all this to, to, together, um, uh, recruiting the speakers and, and pulling everything together. So so thank you very much. Um, so a lot to consider uh, for for ORN members and others. A lot to consider, so we we'll look forward to meeting you just in a few moments over in the VIP breakout room via the separate link. So, thank you very much, and hopefully we'll uh, see you all at a future webinar, and hopefully see you all at a future event uh, sometime in the future. Thanks a million. Bye bye.